Thanks everyone for coming in today. Uh, it's a gorgeous day outside, so I know it's a tough draw to pull you in indoors. Uh, hopefully everyone's uh, had a chance to go look around outside about all the Earth Day activities that are going out on out there. We've got the you know, vendor booths, uh, partner booths, some informational booths. We even have our own internal teams have their own little booths, uh, a ride and drive and stuff like that. Um, but I'd, I'd love to introduce you to uh, Dan Yates. Uh, I'm, I'm Rick Needham. I'm part of our energy and sustainability team here at Google, one of the many teams that focuses on sustainability, and have the pleasure of introducing you to, uh, to Dan, uh, who's a really interesting guy. Um, so he's, uh, he's, actually, he's obviously founded and is currently CEO of Opower, which is a company that's developing home uh, management, energy management software that actually is connected with over like somewhere in the order of 10 to 15 million people uh, homes uh, already. So that's quite a quite an extensive reach that they have in North America and the UK. Um, and they've saved enough power already to I think power the Empire State Building for something like 10 years. So you know not a small amount of savings already. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, before O Power, Dan actually had founded an educational software company called EduSoft. Uh, ended up selling that and then embarking on this trip, which I think he'll talk a little bit about, uh, which sounds like really cool to me. One day I'd love to do it too. It went from the Arctic Circle up in Alaska all the way down to the southern tip of South America. At first I thought it was biking and he said, no, 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 it's actually driving. We drove a car. Um, but that's still a, a, quite an amazing trip. And on that trip, that's where he realized he wanted to dedicate um, his professional career to helping maintain and, uh, um, the, the wild places in the world and dedicate himself to uh, kind of sustainability. Uh, he's also been cited many times as uh, several awards too. He's uh, won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in the greater Washington area and has been a tech titan, which sounds like a really cool label. Three years in a row, um, awesome. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I, something else I found out at lunch is uh, Dan's also a consummate uh, hula hooper. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to procure a hula hoop in time for the talk. Such a shame. He didn't tell me until you know, <laughs> it was too late. But uh, if we run out of good questions, which I hope we don't, you can always ask him about how he became a, a good hula hooper. Uh, but please uh, welcome me, uh, uh, join me in welcoming Dan. And uh, That was like a little Stephen Colbert moment, right? Was yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> now, but please, uh, please join me in welcoming Dan uh, Yates to, uh, to Google. Thanks a lot. It's good to be here. And I actually just realized, um, is there any clicker capability? Because otherwise I will be married to the, uh, no clicker. OK. I will stand here behind the podium then for most of this, unless this is going to, no, it will not. OK. Um, well, good. Uh, happy to be here. Um, excited to be here on Earth Day and honored to be invited uh, to talk uh, uh, better than Halloween, I guess. Um, but um, I was thinking about what I should talk about. Uh, some of you probably know a little bit about Opower um, already. I'll give you a quick overview and in the course of this presentation tell a little bit more about the company. Um, but I was thinking about you know, Earth Day is a day where we're all supposed to be trying to take a, take a day to think about how we can do, do more to help the environment. Uh, and as I was thinking about that, and I've been thinking about um, recently the uh, the, the evolution and the progression of clean tech companies over the last five years since I got into this business, it, it, it hit me there was a theme that I, that I wanted to, to talk about. Uh, and what I, what I want to do is I want to tell a, a story of incremental improvement. Um, so I, I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk not about revolutionary improvement, but evolutionary improvement. And it, you know, as I was thinking, um, you know, when I started Opower, there were all these big, fast-growing clean tech companies uh, in solar and wind and, and biofuels. And many of these companies haven't panned out. And I went through this period of about three or four years where I was really kind of disappointed to see uh, there weren't a lot of other companies even chasing after Opower uh, or doing other, you know, successfully building clean tech companies and having an impact. Uh, and that started to change in the last few years. There's been kind of a second surge of companies. And if you've been tuned into this, you'll hear a lot of talk about how these new clean tech companies, many of them are focused in efficiency, uh, like Opower. Uh, but there's a lot of talk also how they're very capital efficient. They don't need $500 million to get going. Uh, and that is a very important precursor, I think, to, to successfully building a company. If you need a half billion dollars to get it going, you're going to have a very few number of businesses that are going to get off the ground. But I think that 
the story, the theme that has been less talked about, which I actually think is one of the most important ones, is this, is this difference of not trying to boil the ocean, but looking for incremental improvements that when you add them up, actually end up being really massive. Uh, and that is, when I think about OPower, that's the story of our success. Um, so let me tell you, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start at the beginning and tell you, uh, tell you how, this, how this came to be and hopefully in the process carry you through this. To, and, and hey, Eric, good to see you there. <laughs> I see a lot of faces in the, in the audience that I recognize. Um, uh, but hopefully carry you through and see this, this story of incrementalism. So it all started, uh, as described, with a trip uh, through, the, uh, through the Americas, starting at the very top and heading to the very bottom. And this photo here is me and my wife um, as we were in Bolivia at one of the, uh, the highest points of the trip at something like 16,000 feet. Um, so we took this trip. We drove for about a year uh, heading south. It was easy to get directions. Um, and you know, we went on the trip just to have fun. I'd sold my last company, it was an educational software company, uh, and I grew up camping and you know, uh, liked backpacking but wasn't environmentally minded in terms of what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I still say I don't know the difference between the horned owl and the spotted owl, and I probably won't ever. Um, but we went on this trip just to have a, a great time, and we did, and we saw the things that we thought we were gonna see. We saw beautiful animals, we saw like this vicuña in the Bolivian Altiplano, uh, rare uh, cousin of the llama. We saw these amazing forest canopies. I love this photo because it's just so amazing the efficiency with which these trees grow together, yet you know just stop growing right where the other one takes over and capture all the sunlight. Um, and and we had a great time. We also did a lot of just fun tourist kind of stuff. Um, but in the process, we just we saw a lot of the reality of what it's like out there uh, in the rest of the world. I, I, I left on this trip sort of with this naive picture that the US was the most inhabited, most you know, developed country. And in reality, when you go through the rest of the Americas, it's, it's not true. We actually have some pretty rich wild lands that are well protected, and there are other countries that are totally devastated. Uh, and they're not devastated because these guys here, these are not bad guys. These are just, these are just poor people who are trying to you know, incrementally eke out a living, uh, and unfortunately, their incremental steps are working against the environment. Um, so, you know, I came back feeling very viscerally how at risk and fragile the environment is. So, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about this point because I'm quite confident that everyone here in this room uh, knows uh, how at risk and, and fragile the environment is. But this was this is a key part of my story. Uh, this is when, for me, it became really visceral because I could, after this trip, I no longer had to envision it or imagine it. I could remember it. I could remember all the spots where I saw the fragility uh, and I saw how at risk the environment was. Um, and so when I came back, I, I thought about what I should do uh, and you know, basically asked myself the simple question, where do, what do we suck at here? Uh, and, and the answer was pretty clear. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, where we're by far doing the worst is that we use a lot of dirty energy. Um, and so I wanted, to f I wanted to figure out what we could, what I could do to have an impact. And this is, this is 2006. There was actually a lot of energy, no pun intended, or pun intended, clearly. Uh, you know, in, 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 I, was, I was living in San Francisco, um, surrounded by entrepreneurs talking about clean tech. You know, we were getting, there's a lot of progress on wind development. Um, there was a lot of progress on new solar, you, you know, with the utility scale solar here, but also residential solar was taking off the very first inklings of electric vehicles. Um, these things were all seemed so full of potential, and they are full of potential. Um, but what I did, you know, I was, I was living, uh, living in San Francisco, working out of this tiny home office, um, and I downloaded this graph, which was from the DO, or the Energy Information Agency, and this is a wonky little picture that I actually just found that updated version of this morning. Well, almost updated, 2010 anyhow. Um, this is how we use energy in the US. And on the left, you've got all the sources of the generation. And then on the right, you have all the consumption. And it hit me, because I had this thing literally just taped on the wall next to my computer, that every single person I was talking to that was innovating in clean tech, and I'd gone to the big solar conference in San Jose 
it was the second annual conference and there were thousands of people there and Governor Schwarzenegger came and talked. I mean, there's just so much enthusiasm for this stuff. Absolutely every innovation and idea that was being discussed was over here and that there was no one talking about the right side. I really actually think it was thanks to this diagram that I could just see so plainly there was this, this gap missing, this hole. And I, so I just started to ask simply, you know, what about just using less energy? What can we do there? And why, why aren't people focusing on this problem? And it, I'm somewhat of a contrarian, so it gave me a lot of pleasure to think that nobody was thinking about this problem. Um, I didn't have an idea yet, but I knew that there was some open space to, to hunt around. So McKinsey has done a very nice job. This is actually, this, these, their, study, their studies came out after um, I, we started OPower, but quantifying just how much energy is being wasted. And it is astonishing. So uh, just looking at residential energy use in the US at wasted energy between now and 2020, we're gonna waste $400 billion of energy, which is almost 5 trillion pounds of CO2 and 3.4 million gigawatt hours of energy. And this is not, this is not like energy wasted because you bought an extra TV, this, which you could argue is energy wasted. But this is energy wasted by your TV that you bought when you're not using it, you know? And energy wasted by your air conditioner that you're running when you're not home and is making no one more comfortable. It's just a tremendous amount of waste that's sitting there. Um, and so I couldn't help, you know, so, th so it felt big and unattended, but then the important question is, you know, why? Why are people wasting all this energy? It seems like a no-brainer. And this is energy that if, if saved will actually save money. You don't, you don't even have to care about the environment to save this energy. This isn't like solar where it's more expensive than coal. This is just not wasting money and energy. No, one, no one's winning, right? So, you know, here are some of the reasons why. Six minutes. Six minutes is the average amount of time that an American spends thinking about energy use in a year. We all, th most of us here, probably unwilling to admit it, but most of us here probably think about Justin Bieber more than we think about our energy use on an annual basis. It, it's just completely not paid attention to. And the reason why, is a there's a couple reasons. First one is it's boring. It's just not a fun thing to think about. The second thing, which is sort of the more uh, a, a really fundamental problem, is it, it's inexpensive. The average American home spends only 1.7% of their annual income on electricity. So if you save 25% on your energy bill, that's like 0.4.5% impact on your overall expenditures for the year. It's just, it's just, not, it's just not a big deal. Um, so it's, it's boring, it's inexpensive, and the last thing is, is there's just no feedback mechanism. So this is a programmable thermostat, one of many crummy ones out there. Um, and there are great companies, uh, including Opower, that are now working to, um, to make these thermostats much, much more user friendly. But today, the average programmable thermostat is not programmed. In fact, 80% of them are not programmed. And almost nobody remembers to turn off their air conditioner when they leave the house. And why, why is that? It's not, I mean, they're hard to program, but they're not that hard to program. And you can save a lot of money doing it. It's because there's no feedback. You, know, you don't feel bad when you leave the house and the thermostat isn't programmed. What, I, what I've liked to say for a long time is if CO2 were purple and it smelled like rotten eggs, we wouldn't have an energy problem. You would turn off your thermostat because your house would stink. If you didn't, your neighbors would see it and get angry at you. Hey, you're the damn house with all the purple smoke. You know, but there just isn't, there is no feedback. There's no... There's no emotional connection to this, and it just, it isn't visceral, and it doesn't, it's not that expensive, and so we all just plow along and we waste our $400 billion worth of electricity. Um, okay, so that's, pro that's, these are all problems, right? But so how, how, do, we, how do we fix this? Um, how do we, you know, how do we correct this, these, these misconceptions? So I was looking at this, thinking about these different ideas, and I was very fortunate to run across this study by Robert Cialdini, who is a world-renowned behavioral psychologist. He's written a book called Influence that's um, uh, prescribed reading at the GSB, uh, at, at Harvard Business School, um, published in a dozen in, uh, languages internationally. Uh, and he had just done this study. And what, um, and what he was trying to do is he was trying to figure out how to get people to take an, act, an environmental action and figure out what would motivate people to save energy. 
So here's the study he did. It was in San Marcos, California. It was a suburb of San Diego. And he was trying to get people to turn off their air conditioner and turn on their fan in the evening. So he had a bunch of grad students working for him. They went around. They printed up all these door hangers. Uh, they, uh, they went door to door. They hung these things on the doors. And they had different treatments. And they had a, a control group. They actually had two different varieties of control. There was a very statistically significant, you know, well-structured academic study. And they would re read the meters in each of the homes uh, after they uh, had hung up these door hangers to see if they were having an impact. So the first treatment was you know, monetary. You know, you could save 50 bucks every month if you turn off your AC and switch to a fan. Second one was environmental. Help save the environment, keep the skies clean, take XYZ pounds of CO2 out of the air, just turn off your AC and switch to a fan in the evening. Third message was a societal sort of citizenship, save money for, for future, help, sa help conserve resources for our future generations. Turn off your AC, switch to a family thing. So they ran these. They did this week after week, all summer long. These groups, zero impact. It was as if they had not been there. And this is about as expensive of a marketing campaign as you can do. No company can afford to go door to door, even with grad students hanging door hangers every week. It just, it's a, you know, if we can't get people to, to do some simple no-cost behavioral uh, change with this kind of marketing, nothing's going to work. But wait, there was one more treatment. Make room for it. There was a simple last door hanger that said, in a recent survey of your neighbors, 75% of them turn off their AC and switch to a fan in the evening. Join your neighbors. Turn off your AC, switch to a fan in the evening. This group saved 6%. And this, this sustained throughout the duration of this study all through the summer. <laughs> so what does this mean? It means that people benchmark to the norm. And we know this in a lot of other circumstances. Uh, but this is a really powerful tool. Um, and it's actually a very rational thing for us to do. The, the instinct that uh, we all have when we hear this is you know, keeping up with the Joneses. We like to keep up with the Joneses, and we've all been taught by our moms and dads not to keep up with the Joneses because it's not how you're supposed to lead your life. But the reality is that uh, if you're operating in a complex environment like energy usage, you don't know much about it. You don't want to be an expert. Most people don't. Benchmarking to what the wisdom of the crowd says is actually a really good shortcut for figuring out whether or not you know, you're in line, whether or, not, whether or not you're doing what you ought to be doing or, or living your life the way that is, is, most, is most reasonable. And we see this, uh, you know, we see, we see norms throughout our lives. We have these buffoonish guys who are all very happy with themselves because they all look like each other and they're not ashamed of it. But if you put one of them in this room, they might feel a little awkward. And then you have, on the nicer side of the spectrum, you know, uh, women in, in beautiful saris. No one here is wearing a sari today, uh, but you know, this is absolutely a norm that is, and they're all almost wearing the same color sari, actually, that is you know, totally established in other parts of the, of the, of the world uh, and, and totally normal and, and, and beautiful. So you know, if we had norms like this about energy use, we'd probably all start you know, wearing the same energy clothes and start drafting off of each other. But there is no, there's no signals. You know, you have no, you, most people don't know if they're efficient or not. And to me, the data, the, the, the graph that has most illustrated this for me is, is this graph, which I have not labeled, so I, you have to wait with bated breath for me to explain what it is. Um, so we have a ton of data now. We have uh, almost half of the US energy data under management in our co-location facilities. Uh, uh, Edo Power, because we work with most of the major utilities in the U.S., and when we work with them, the first thing they do is they send us all their consumer energy data. So we've been able to do some really interesting analytics. And what we looked at, and this is actually something that we did from the very, very beginning, is we looked at how dispersed is the energy consumption of a set of similar homes in the same neighborhood. So taking, for each home, the 100 closest homes of similar square footage in of most you know, closest proximity, so basically an algorithm that weights your distance in real distance with your distance in terms of house size and tries to find the, you know, the minimally distant set of homes. How, how different is consumption across those homes? And this is the graph that we get no matter where we do it. And what it basically comes out is that in any given home, in every, any, any given neighborhood, more than 30%, more than 50% of the homes are further than 30% from the mean. 
So you have this big dispersion of energy use. Uh, and to me, the, the signal that, uh, the, what, what, this, what this signifies is, is a couple things. First, everything I just said, the energy use, you know, is, is n there is no feedback and people are kind of drifting off into their, on their own trajectories of consumption, some using more, some using less. The second thing is that energy use is, is elastic because if there's this much variability within similar homes and similar areas, there must be an opportunity to, to reduce that usage. And this is what gave me a lot of the confidence early on when we started the company that there would be an opportunity to, to change the norms and to move behaviors. So, so, so the opportunity was clear. And, and thanks to this study by Robert Cialdini and some research that we did on how energy efficiency markets work, and there's about a $10 billion a year energy efficiency market uh, internationally, uh, we ran some math and realized that if we could make, if we could change behavior by a few percent, we could actually have a real business. So this is where we, so where, so this, where do we start? Here, we started with the utility bill. This is your typical craptastic utility bill. Uh, you know, barely tells you how much you owe, uh, and then it gives you, this is actually a real bill. I think we cut off the name of the utility to save their reputation, but you know, you've got your, the price of natural gas to eight decimal points, just for good measure, uh, and yet no, no useful information to really help you figure anything else out about your usage other than how much you owe. So this felt like a big opportunity to improve, and we applied all the, all the lessons from that study and our own best practices from direct marketing and, uh, uh, and software analytics to deliver this first product. And this was uh, Opower's Home Energy Report. Uh, and it sent, we, sent, we did our first program with SMUD uh, just up in Sacramento nearby. Uh, and we started sending home these mailers that showed people how their energy use um, compared to their neighbors, to their approximately 100 occupied homes that are similar in size. Um, we gave, uh, Alex Eagle here actually wrote a lot of the energy calculator code that made this, uh, this first uh, report possible. Um, we sent these out, we set it up as a clinical trial with a test and control group so that we were able to exactly measure the impact. Uh, and we started to get these great results. So here are many results now from many of our utility programs. Each line represents that difference between the average consumption of the test group minus, of the control group minus the test group. And so we've consistently been getting this one and a half to three and a half percent reduction. It's gone on now for over four years. Uh, every year we, we tend to see a, a slight increment in savings of these groups as they progress um, and uh, customers accumulate some energy saving measures they, that, that, that are long lasting, like somebody replaces a refrigerator, et cetera. Um, and important to our business model, which is not as important to the environment, but uh, is important to our longevity, when you turn off this program, the savings diminish. So you, you can't, you, you know, once you, once you use it, you're hooked. Um, but uh, but the, thing that, the thing that I also want to flag, and these are just some of the the, the groups that have certified our results, the third parties that have evaluated it. But the thing that I want to highlight is one and a half to three and a half percent doesn't seem like that much, right? It's just, it isn't. For a consumer, if I were selling it to you, you would be disinterested, you wouldn't buy it. Luckily, our business is we sell the utilities, they buy blocks of hundreds of thousands or millions of homes, and we deliver it, and it's free to the consumer. But for an average consumer, this just isn't, this isn't a big impact. But, so I'll get back to that in a few slides because I want to show you how much this has added up to. Um, so, so we started with this normative comparison, uh, but you know, behavioral science was just the beginning and, and we immediately started to look to analytics and what we could do with personalized recommendations. So I just want to highlight, I'll, I'll touch on just a, a couple th neat things that we do uh, and, then, and then I'll bring this, this speech to a close and we can, and we can talk further. Um, this is one of the features that I really, really like. So what we do is, um, so we are now, we don't have Google size data, but we have some pretty big data. We, we're running it all um, on a Hadoop grid, and we've custom developed uh, a batch processing system that sits on top of it because we need very, we need perfect reliability and restartability of our, of our batch jobs because we're not just running large scale sort of approximate analytics. We have to get results for every single customer uh, and get it right every single time. So we've got this, this system that's pretty slick um, data platform that we've built. 
Uh, and what we do on it is we're able to run this multivariate regression analysis where we can separate out using your smart meter data and the local weather data stream, the hourly data stream, using uh, both temperature and humidity. We're able to separate out the parts of your usage, uh, the biggest piece of your usage, your heating, your cooling, your base load, which is the stuff that's on all the time, and then, and then everything else. And with that, we're able to do things like send you this, whether it's in the mail or on our website, uh, or when you call in, have the CSR at the utility tell you, you know, how your heating usage compares to the average. And this becomes incredibly valuable because we can start to focus you on where you need to be, um, wh where, what actions you need to be taking. Um, so, you know, this shows up on our web portal and we have a breakdown and we bring you to the first most important part of your usage. And we've now direct, we direct that um, immediately to, to recommendations. Oops, and we've partnered with retailers um, and other third parties to connect this to, to action. So trying to really draw this whole flow through. We've, mo we've, inf we've, we've identified you have a, an opportunity, we motivate you, we explain to you what it is, and then we say, hey look, here's, here's the action that you can take to, to insulate your home. And so this is where Opower has, has grown. Um, we started with this report, and now we have this, it's really this whole platform this customer-centric experience as we talk to the utilities about it, but you know, for us consumers, it's just suddenly the utility actually got smart and is giving you all the stuff they, they should be giving you that makes energy information easy and digestible. So we have the reports like I showed, we have a social app that we just launched, we have this great outage and alerts platform so we can give you preemptively a notification if you're on track for a high bill before you get the high bill. Um, we have all these consumer marketing features like the coupon I just showed. We're launching an API platform and mobile apps, um, and we have this great website. And now also we're doing, uh, in partnership with Honeywell, a thermostat uh, where we're giving people the ability to, to control their usage much more easily and using a, an Android or, or iPhone app. So, so this is what our company has turned into. But the reason why I want to tell you this is, you know, I started with this this, we had this simple idea, we identified a blank space, and we looked for making an incremental improvement. And we did make that improvement, and it's steamrolled, and it's snowballed, rather. You can't do both. Um, and uh, and here's, where we've, here's where we are today. So we've saved 900 gigawatt hours, almost a terawatt hour of energy, um, which I was just hearing is about half of what Google uses uh, on an annual basis. So, in which we all think of Google as being a pretty big power consumer, and we're we're saving almost we're saving almost half what Google's generating or consuming. We've saved consumers a hundred million dollars, uh, and that turns into six hundred fifty thousand tons of CO two. But all of these reference points to me are not as as clear or compelling as this one. Last year, we saved as much energy as half of the entire U.S. solar industry. So we think of solar as this non-incremental, transformative, turn everything on its head technology, and it is. But we, with this incremental approach, have saved one company half as much energy as all of the solar companies combined did in the U.S. last year. And if we, if we ran what we do at Opower, and it doesn't have to be Opower, but our you know, approach worldwide, it would be 211 coal-fired power plants that we could shut down, which is a tremendous, tremendous amount of energy savings. So, so this, is, this is my point. Incrementalism is powerful, and I think that there's so many opportunities out there. And on Earth Day, the reason why I picked this as the theme uh, is because when you think about the, you know, Earth Day is the day to think globally and act locally. Um, and Opower is a company that in many ways gets the pleasure to just tally up all of the disparate thinking globally, acting locally actions of our customers, and we happen to be able to count it up and, and report it out. But what we're really doing it uh, fundamentally is motivating millions of people to make small changes, and it does make a difference. So that's my, that's my message for today, uh, and, and uh, thank you guys for taking the time uh, to come out, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So it, my Say question was about water. I mean, <laughs> if you have any opportunity there. Yeah, yeah, we definitely do. So we actually work with, today we work with both electricity and gas, um, and we work with a bunch of utilities that serve both. Uh, and we were just talking about this at lunch. Um, 
Water is, a, is an easy next step for us. And the only reason we've been held back is that there is just, um, while, the, while the, the need is as obvious, the, um, the sort of regulatory and policy infrastructure isn't there, so the money isn't there. So it's very hard to find people who will pay you to do it um, and to build a business on it. But what we have is a number of utilities who actually provide all three, like in Palo Alto, it's gas, electricity, and water. I think they even do waste as well. But So we're going to probably start reporting on water for those utilities. But it's the same. And there's another company. There's a company called WaterSmart, I think, that's trying to do this. They've, I've heard them called, calling themselves the O power of water, so I can presume that that's what they're doing. So in one of the slides, you identified um, opportunities for third-party app development through an API mm -hmm. that you'll be offering. I'm just curious to hear um, any ideas you have on what some of those apps might look like and whether or not you think your company will allow those apps to leverage the um, energy saving recommendations that you offer because mm -hmm. I know that, I mean, in my mind, there's a huge market for that. But yeah. just curious to hear what you think some of these apps might look like. So we're just getting started on this. Actually, Wayne Lynn, who is a former Googler, who is our head of product management for this uh, part of our business, all of our web and uh, social and API strategy um, is here today, but he's not here in the audience. Otherwise, I would just hand it over to him. But the, there, there's a couple different things that we're looking at. So. Our order of priorities um, is actually f starting first, starting first with the enterprise, and then extending more and more to sort of third-party um, uh, APIs. So the first, the first set, which we've already have live, is, is actually, ironically, just giving, uh, exposing the analyzed data back to our utility partners because they don't have the the wherewithal to to do this kind of analytics on their own data. Second evolution for us is building kind of like an integration framework. So for other utility uh, facing companies that want to provide services to utilities, we can expose access to that data with utility permission. And then these providers don't have to integrate and do all the kind of heavy lifting that we do to connect with these utilities. And then the third is connecting to third party, uh, is making it, you know, Provided, putting in place all of the permissioning and everything to authenticate third parties and let consumers you know, turn on and off different third party apps. Some of the examples that, that we have top of mind are that we got uh, Zillow reached out to us. They actually very interested in being able to manifest a certified last 12 months bill on any new home listings so that somebody can get credit for investing in energy efficiency. Mint has sort of a similar interest in being able to help separate their pie chart of energy use to show you where your, you know, where your waste is uh, within your overall consumption, your, you know, expenditures. Um, and then we've been talking to some weather uh, websites that are also interested. So that's been the areas where there's been the most interest. But one of the APIs that we've just developed has been top tips. So exactly to your point, and I think that there will be a lot of uh, that. Actually, is one of the things the weather companies are interested in. You know. It's going to be hot. Here's top tips for you for saving energy this summer. How much customization do you have to do for utilities who want different levels of engagement? Um, and have you found that dealing with different utility personalities has been a tricky part of the process? So we are, at the end of the day, whether I like it or not, an enterprise software as a service business. So we deal with big enterprise customers who, have, who write us huge checks. Um, and we and have every right to ask us to do things for them um, that as a consumer facing company you would tell that consumer to go away or buy something else. <clears throat> the flip side is that enterprise customers stick with you for a long time um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a mutual relationship, it's a mutual partnership. Um, so that sounds like a long way of me saying we do a lot of customizations. We actually don't do a lot of customizations. So we have built um, we do, a, uh, we do a lot of configuration, and we've built a lot of configuration into our platform. So the variance um, across utilities, and increasingly we've been better and better at this as we continue to invest in our technology. Uh, utilities vary wide, widely in what they've, um, what they've deployed in terms of how many, um, how many reports they've sent or whether or not they're system-wide or not. But in terms of the actual features themselves, we don't build a lot of custom applications for, for, for partners. I mean, it's, it's like, I, t from a business model perspective, we look in this part of our business at companies like salesforce.com or you know, other cloud-based enterprise companies uh, where they've built really thoughtful 
um, platforms that then allow configurability without having to write new code, let the, or let the customer write the code. It's likely that a lot of people actually here already understand this, but you, you're partnering with a lot of the power companies, and I'm just not really getting why, they, what's motivating them. Why do utilities do this? Yeah, what it, what it, what's the model there? Mm -hmm. Great question. So, um, so there's a couple of different answers. The way we started the business was very, um, very focused on energy efficiency. And so utilities have these state mandates that, uh, that require them to hit these efficiency standards. They're called energy efficiency resource standards. And basically every populous state in the US now has a standard that these utilities are being held to. And so what, the, what happens is the commission, the utility commission in each state will set a goal uh, certain terawatt hour goal that will, or gigawatt hour goal that we pass down pro rata to the utilities in that um, state. The utilities will then put together a portfolio uh, of programs that are proposed back to the commission every three years, and then based upon the cost of those programs, they will uh, uh, they'll put a tax on the utility bill that funds these programs. So uh, that's been, and from a utility perspective, in this regard, it's really a compliance exercise. They don't have any stake in it but they've been mandated to do it, and they definitely adhere to commission mandates because the commission is their one customer, really, where they get approval or denial for building new things. So that was, that was the core value proposition for us starting the company. What's happened now is we've grown, and as the utility industry has started to evolve in this direction, as utilities are realizing that their future is much more consumer-centric than they, it ever has been, or certainly for the last 85 years, and Many of them may be as more than they wish it were, uh, but as this sort of as this political spotlight has been shined on the utility industry, it's not easy to go build a dirty coal plant anymore. And so, to hit capacity requirements, um, to you know, to deal with to handle new population growth, and to and to invest in new infrastructure, which is how utilities make money, they're finding that all of their new investments inevitably are more consumer intertwined. So whether it's smart meters, where we've all heard about the crazy ruckus here about people being upset about them, or peaking, peak reduction programs where they try to get you to install a thermostat that you know, reduces your peak usage. There's a lot of interaction you have to have with the consumer. And so as utilities are moving in that direction, they're realizing they need this sort of consumer infrastructure to engage customers and to be able to to, to provide a better value, also, also as rates are rising, which is the other thing that's happening, is people are not allowing coal plants to be built. So for all these reasons, it becomes politically very important for the utility to have a much better capability to engage the consumer. And so that's sort of how, as we've grown, how this has grown. And then it's still at the core, you know, what we like to say is an energy efficient customer is a happy customer, because you know, we just want to save money on our bills. So that's a major factor. So the question is, we have this feedback loop where we're sending signals once a month. Do we have the capability to send it faster? So we definitely have the capability to send it faster. I think the question is, you know, we're taking six minutes a year of attention up to 12 minutes. Can we take it up to, you know, 400 minutes? And I think at some point the answer is no. People don't actually want to think about their energy use that much. So where we're focused, one of our mantras for a long time has been um, insights and analytics trump real time, that people actually don't want to get feedback constantly, they want to get more and more richer and richer and more and more tailored feedback. So, you know, I th always, always come back to, I was thinking about like what would my mom want to get. My mom would love to get a notice in the spring that says, last summer was a doozy, you paid twice as much as your neighbors on AC, here's the top three things you should do to, you know, to, to save energy this summer on air conditioning, rather than getting a weekly or uh, or a daily email about her energy use. But that being said, one of the features we've just rolled out is a, daily, is a weekly uh, smart meter uh, enabled update on your usage for people who are engaged at that level. So we do, we do emails as frequently as people want and we do alerts now. We're doing, for some of these utilities that have uh, load reduction days, we'll send out, you know, for one utility, two million emails in like 30 minutes uh, because we've got to get We've got to get all these people, you know, this information. Yeah, so I'm hearing two different questions. Maybe I'm, but so let's see if I can answer this. Um, there's this long-term challenge of, okay, so if everybody installs residential PV, there's kind of 
no energy efficiency doesn't matter anymore, right? I've so uh, I have two thoughts, or I have a number of thoughts on that. One is, God, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd be happy to go out of business if everybody loaded up with solar PV. Uh, but, but on top of that, I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's going to be a long, slow slog. We've been at it for, it's really in earnest been going on for five years now, and I think there's, they're just nearing 100,000 solar homes in the U.S., which is 1,000th of the number of homes. So we've got a long way to go. Within that, I think there's a ton of opportunity for us to help promote solar, to help uh, report back on solar, um, to aggregate solar, lots of different things that can be done, and to be involved in selling it, you know, not in addition to just promoting it, um, and financing, et cetera. Uh, so that, to me, is a long-term opportunity and problem, and at this, in the same time frame as, as solar starts to happen, that's why we are getting into things like thermostats, and we'll be, you know, as electric vehicles become more scaled, We'll be looking at what we can do there. Um, the other question was sort of about whether or not behave, what if behavior kind of dries up, and that one is I've got about you know uh, at least a hundred thousand years of evolutionary history to say that we're going to stick with the pack for the next hundred years. So that one I'm not too worried about. <laughs> yeah. So if you're city Palo Alto, if you're a city of Palo Alto residents, you should be getting our home energy reports, which are sent home in the mail or email. Who is a city of Palo Alto resident here? Are you getting it? Yeah. What's your neighbor rank? <laughs> <laughs> no. What's your neighbor rank? Do you know what your neighbor rank is? No, no, oh, no, okay. <laughs> I ask because most people tend to know it, and I always like to highlight it because uh, the fact that people can remember it is indicative of the amount of attention it captures. But unfortunately, this didn't play out so well <laughs> in this group. Um, so in Palo Alto, we're just sending out the reports. They don't ha we, haven't, we haven't started to do any of the web offerings, and Palo Alto doesn't have smart meters. Um, at PG&E, we're sending reports to a lot of customers, but probably many of you aren't getting them because we're tar we started with them targeting the, the largest homes. So um, we have something like 300,000 homes, I think, of the, f of the 5 million getting <coughs> reports. And then the biggest thing we're doing at PG&E today is we're powering all of their, most of the website. So when you log into My Energy, the two tabs that are about um, uh, ways to save, and I forget what the other one is called. I think it's called like My Energy Use. Those tabs are entirely powered by us. Uh, and then we also have all of the, if you, wanna, if you look at changing rates at PG&E, the tool that helps you analyze that uh, is, is an O-Power tool. Now, I was just talking to um, Kevin, I don't know his last name, uh, Chen, uh, in the sustainability group about, um, his experience with the with this rate switching tool, and he wanted so on behalf of him, I'll let you know. When you get to the end, it makes you call PG&E, and then you have to spend a half an hour dealing with their phone tree to finally get to the point where you can switch your rates. That's not our fault. They have they were unable to, they had no APIs to send rate switch signals to any piece of their infrastructure. So we have to, like basically, put a little thing that says call PG&E and read them this. So. Uh, Implementations, you know, are imperfect with these utilities, but but it's been exciting. We, we are, PG&E has actually been a great customer. They also have signed on to the social app. So if you go to social.opower.com, you can utility connect with both PG&E and City of Palo Alto, and you can compare with your friends. Uh, and we're gonna we're continuing to invest a lot in that application. We just launched it, and there's a lot more to do. Um, yeah, so we, uh, the question is, how, how have we tackled commercial buildings? So there's two areas in commercial buildings that we're probably not going to tackle. One is where there's a master metered building where there isn't individual metering because we just don't have, uh, we're, we're all about the metered data. Um, and at least now, we're not in the business of metering. So we wait for people to do their own metering. In a lot of places in older buildings that are not individually metered, it's not just the electric circuits actually don't enable individual metering, so it's not uh, it's not trivial. Um, and the other place is really big, really big buildings and big um, commercial enterprises. Uh, we're probably not going to. It's going to be a long time before we get there. And the reason there is that just it's just a different problem set. If you can afford to, if you have an if you have a full time energy manager like Walmart does, and they have a whole team of them, and you can afford to have people come on site and do audits. Our expertise in behavioral psychology and, and you know, direct marketing is, is uh, outgunned by door knockers. Um, so 
uh, where we are expanding is into small medium business, which in many ways is kind of like a stratified uh, prosumer or you know uh, heavy uh, large con large consumer. So, uh, and there we're, we are we've already done some stuff and we're looking to do more. So um, I have a question about the size of the opportunity ahead of you. Um, you made a comparison to the solar industry, so obviously you're doing huge work in energy reduction. But solar is really low on its exponential curve. Right yeah. You cited some numbers for how many uh, installations there are residentially. Um, but you, so I heard a couple numbers from you, which is that you have half of all US energy usage under, under management. Um, if that's the case and you're kind of asymptotically approaching two, three percent. Then I can only double and then I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me answer that. Yeah. yeah. That, so like we have, on. that's great. Um, this is a very smart audience. All of my little stats are being finally picked apart in the right way, which is good. So um, we manage half of the US energy data right now on behalf of these utilities, uh, which is a great capability. It's a great position to be in so that we can do things like launch an API platform or launch APIs on our platform. Or we can, um, for example, with social, when we turned it on for a new utility, we didn't have to get any more data from them. We already had it. But <coughs> we are only monetizing probably 10% of that data that we have under management. So, and a good example is when we sold ComEdison in the Illinois region and Chicagoland area, um, we had a 50,000 home program with them and they gave us all 3 million homes worth of data. Uh, and that, the, that's the case all over the place. So, our, you know, to talk about our business, our TAM is in the multiple billions of dollars between three and five billion, and then, you know, we're nowhere near that right now in terms of our, you know, our growth. So, I, we, we're, we're, it's very, the, there's a lot of great stuff ahead of us. So our, our big expansion areas are domestically in the U.S. We still have new utilities to sell, and we have a lot of expansion within our existing utilities, and then we're just now starting to really uh, expand internationally, and that, that opportunity is as big as the U.S. opportunity. And that's just market expansion, and then we continue to build new products. So, like this thermostat, which I'm excited about, which is going to be a totally new product line. So. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. We haven't looked that much at the interfaces of electric cars. We did, I was at an event last spring, and I actually talked to a business development guy at GM who said, hey, you should come talk to us because we're designing some new cars and we want to talk to you about the interface. And we just it didn't make it high enough up on the priority list because um, we didn't feel like it was believable and you know, it was going to be small scale and they don't have an electric car yet, or they almost do, but not quite. And, um, so that is an interesting opportunity. And I think we haven't looked into that that much. The area where we've thought a little bit more is um, charging management, because there's a big, that's where the utilities, the utilities are thrilled that they're gonna be these new power consumers on their grid using up more energy and they can make money off of them. What they're uh, confused about is how is this gonna work because an electric vehicle in charging mode is kind of like a house. And so you drive, it's like you're driving houses around and jamming them into the grid and all of a sudden the transformer melts. That's very, very expensive compared to the value of the electricity from the, from the car. So they're trying to get a handle on how they manage that. Um, we have, we are, there are lots of companies that are astute, astutely going after this in, in a way that we haven't yet, but it's, it's, a, it's an area that we're kind of monitoring. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different, people taking a lot of different tacks. One is like these sort of charging station networks, kind of like Zipcar for charging. Well, not really, but whatever, you get it. And then another, you know, another way is like Better Place has tried to do it where you have replaceable batteries and they're essentially gas stations for, um, that, uh, for batteries. Um, and then there's the third way, which is that people just don't have either and you just charge your car at home and maybe you know, cut a deal at your office to charge your car there. Um, and and I, I think it's to be seen how much these other, you know, I think this is all, this is all early days, so it's to be seen what's going to stick or not. No, I, I think it, it's, it's actually not that complicated. The, the, there, are a lot of, um, there are a lot of decoy facts out there that are hard to parse, parse out, like the tiered pricing, which is a, 
mandated structure from, this is a California f uh, phenomenon, and it's mandated by the Utility Commission as a way to try and essentially charge r rich people more for electricity and, and discourage overconsumption. Um, but that's not a f sort of a fact of the energy market. It's just, it's a, it's a policy manipulation. The core, the core dynamic is just, it's just think about like cell phone companies. <clears throat> they have a network they put a lot of money into, they want you to use it, but they max out at peak times. And then they have these trough times where there's no usage. So, and just like a cell phone network, they have all these, they can't turn, they can't shut down the, the, you know, the base stations at night. And even if they did, it doesn't matter because you know, the base station is, is you build as many of them out to meet peak demand, not because of, and, and so it's just wasted at night. The, the cell phone companies would be happy to pay you probably to use their network. It doesn't, it means nothing to them at nighttime, right? So why they have nights and weekend plans. So it's the exact same thing with, with, uh, with utilities and with, with the sort of the peak usage and the, the, the off time usage. And with, with coal plants, the problem is, and with all these baseload plants, is they literally, they take 24 hours to power up. So they can't shut them off at night. And so that is not just a waste of capital in the infrastructure, but it's actually a huge waste of emissions and fuel. Um, so they just so, so the utilities are motivated to reduce peak. They have an endemic interest in doing that, and then the commissions, which are you know, you should think of them as your proxy, uh, are motivated in reducing overall usage because they want to save people money and help the environment. So the commissions will set these efficiency standards, and the utilities go out and try and come up with ways to to shave peak, and those are basically the two major dynamics. In some, it, in in the top hours, it, it's a it's a loss. In the the worst hours of the year, it can be a loss, depending on the utility. If the utility has their own generation, or if they have if they're buying on the open market. Yeah, yeah the, the utilities the utility when utility exec wakes up in the morning, he does not want or she does not want um, to deliver energy efficiency. They may be interested. They are in many cases interested in reducing peak. And then the commission wakes up in the morning and says, "I want to save." citizens of California energy and money and help the environment. And that's the group who says, let's have an efficiency standard. And then the utility says, well, if they want it, I got to endear myself to them because they're my buyer when I go to try and sell them this next thing. So maybe I should take into consideration this efficiency stuff. And then, you know, the complex political intertanglings continue to unfold. Uh, but those are the two major fundamentals. All right, thank you guys so much for so many great questions. <laughs>